One of my favorite books is by Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning. And Viktor Frankl says, say yes to life in spite of everything. And I think that is a really good motto. Yes to life, in spite of all the no and uh, the injustice, keep saying yes. That's Karen Duffy, and this is the Powerful Ladies Podcast. Hey guys, I'm Kara Duffy, a business coach and entrepreneur on a mission to help you live your most extraordinary life by showing you anything is possible. People who have mastered freedom, ease, and success, who are living their best and most ridiculous lives, and who are making an impact, are often people you've never heard of until now. Today's guest, Karen Duffy, has a diverse and impactful assortment of careers. She broke into the world stage as the MTV VJ Duff in the early 1990s, was on People's 50 Most Beautiful People list in 1993. She is an actor, a model, a producer, an Oprah and New York Times bestselling author, a speaker, a writer, and in addition, has had a full assortment of social service roles, including being a hospice chaplain in the Buddhist tradition. In 1996, she was diagnosed with sarcoidosis, a currently incurable chronic pain illness. And while it may have slowed her down in moments, it has not stopped her from working, creating, or making a huge impact. In this episode, we dive into the wisdom of stoicism, the power of gratitude, how to be joyful through the pain, and why serving others is the answer to everything. We also discuss her latest projects, the Bill Murray documentary, New Worlds, the upcoming movie, Greatest Beer Run Ever, starring Zac Efron, and her soon-to-be-released newest book. Welcome to the Powerful Ladies Podcast. Thank you very much. I'm from one Duffy to another. Exactly. Well, let's jump right in and tell everyone your name, where you are in the world, and what you're up to. My name is Karen Duffy, and I'm in Greenwich Village in New York City. And uh, I am, uh, I'm, I'm a writer. I write about Stoic philosophy, and I'm also uh, a film producer. And uh, I have a new film out right now that I associate produced called The Greatest Beer Run Ever. Um, so uh, I'm really making the most out of life. Yeah. And I also love that you started your career as a VJ. Yes. I- I'm, uh, I'm old enough to remember what a VJ is because they were amazing. They had the coolest careers ever. <laughs> You know, it was amazing, Kara. When I started my career, I was a recreational therapist. I really grew up in a family where service was the rent we pay for life on earth. And we, as big Irish Catholic family, we all had to um, find ways to be of service. And I really loved working at a nursing home. And so I started working at the village nursing home, which is right around the corner when I was 12 and kept, I stayed there. I loved it. I went away to college and got my degree in recreational therapy. And when I moved back to New York, I was hired back by the nursing home. And I feel that the skills that we have in life are transferable. And so I recognized that my elocution had to be clear, uh, the way I moved my body, that I was working with uh, my clients who had Alzheimer's and had impacted uh, attention spans and memory. And everyone kept saying MTV was ruining America's attention span. So I figured, oh, I've got the skill set for that. And uh, <laughs> So it was serendipitous. I think having the confidence of doing, I knew I was a great recreational therapist and uh, I still carry on as a volunteer in my life. But I think that gave me the confidence to just go for it, take the shot, send it in my video. I'd never been on camera before. And I wound up getting the primetime VJ slot, which was amazing within about two weeks. So um, I think that we should always remember like to carry those, those feelings of, of, of success, of purpose and meaning, and then they can help us figure out our next steps. 
Mm -hmm. Well, you you never know what's going to cross your path. You really don't. Um, I love whenever people talk about the importance of being presence, present, excuse me, is more about being able to see what's right in front of you and all the cool things you have access to almost more than being still with your thoughts. Like, how do we just stop being distracted first? <laughs> you know, it's, it's true. I think we have to expand our sweet spot for luck. And Seneca said, you know, opportunity and preparation equals luck. Um, and uh, Mickey Mantle said, like, the more I practice, the lucky I get. So it's a mindset, mm -hmm. um, but also being aware of opportunities. Like we were saying, like, one of the things I love about your podcast is that you, I feel like your messages, it's like ideas don't count unless you take action. And everybody has ideas, but we have to take action. And that is a great inspiration in my life that I really appreciate that I've gotten from you. Thank you. And, you know, I'd love to go back to, to stoicism because it's, people know, we'll call people stoic, but I don't think a lot of people understand really what stoicism is and how a lot more of it's ingrained in common Western vernacular than we give it credit for. So could you give people a little bit of background of like what it is, what it represents and how you fell into being passionate about it? Um, well, I think that when people hear the small S word of stoic, meaning essentially a stiff upper lip, um, that is very different from Stoic philosophy uh, with a capital S. And um, Stoic philosophy goes back uh, 23 centuries ago. And in ancient Athens, there the Greek word for porch is stoa. So again, this is the golden age of the philosophers. So Aristotle had his peripatetic school where he felt all the highest ideas came uh, when you were in peripatia, when you were walking. Plato had his academy, where I just spoke last a couple of weeks ago. And um, the Stoics believed that this is a practical philosophy of love and that it should be available for to everyone. So they had they gathered in this open air porch where you can still visit in Athens, the Stoa Porchile. And um, so where people think that you, know, you can get confused with the stiff upper lip, but I think that Stoic philosophy, this philosophy of love, is about turning that lip into a big smile that's just gripping your face. How did you discover Stoicism? So when I got my gig at MTV and I realized that with responsibility comes a lot, you know, with a lot of power, and I felt like I if I was going to be a voice of popular culture, I should actually look back at the classics. And um, I really, my first, the first book I read was Marcus Aurelius Meditations, and it just blew my mind. And the first book that I, first book that I wrote, Model Patient, I, I read it recently, and I have so many quotes from Marcus Aurelius. It's kind of um, stunning. So, uh, I felt like with responsibility, like I, I need to educate myself. I feel like every day we have an opportunity to be a wee less stupid than we were the day before. Hopefully. And, um, <laughs> so uh, progressing from Marcus Aurelius to Epictetus. Um, Epictetus, the thesis of my new book, Wise Up, is... He says, if you make beautiful choices, you will make a beautiful life. And this just reverberated through me like a firecracker in a silverware drawer. It's like, exactly. The Stoics are really known for what they call the dichotomy of control, which says, we can't control what happens. We can only control how we respond. Um, and uh, so it is, it is a, I, I, I can't wait to wake up in the morning to work on my next book about uh, Stoic philosophy, because it is so rewarding. It's so rich. And what's really interesting is, you know, I was just in Athens for a week speaking uh, at a conference on Stoicism for Modern Life. And all of these eggheads, all of the like, they, like, like all of these 
dusty philosophers from Oxford and Cambridge. They were incredible. They embraced me. They understood that there is room for wise assery in stoicism <laughs> and to get it out into every, I, I try, they, and they kept saying like, these are like unbelievably uh, educated uh, philosophers and they're like how come you find all the funny stuff in stoicism and it's because it's what i'm looking for and uh i truly believe that stoicism it's not just about living your life it's about loving the living of your life one i for me i can't imagine having as much fun in life if there isn't a little snarky wise assery going on like I, I put so much value in in the skate and punk rock past lives that I've had because there's something nice about being skeptical of things and being like, mm-hmm, let me, <laughs> like, I'm <laughs> suspicious first, um, which I, I think is well-balanced as I've become an adult. But I really appreciate that approach of, be, of the humor and skepticism and that view on things, making it a little less precious, I think has been helpful. Absolutely. And um, I, uh, I am on a mission because I love my life and it is not perfect. I have a chronic illness. I live with chronic pain. Uh, but I believe that uh, reading the Stoics I have created a scaffolding and it helps me think when I don't know what to think. And so I am here to pass on this joy. And I feel like I try and distill all of these ideas and then put them out in a really friendly, loving way that hopefully mm -hmm. people will embrace. And that, that is a, 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 the great joy of my life. I love it. And I just, um, you know, for new ideas, we often have to go back to old books and because uh, we're all reading the same popular literature, we're all going to have the same ideas. And so I love that books are not just lifeless lumps of paper. They are minds alive on the shelf. As I can see, you have many right in back of you. Uh, reading. If, if I couldn't read anymore, I don't know what I would do. Like it, books have always been such a a love of mine since I was young and I'm such a consumer of them still. Like this is me trying to be cautious and like weaning down my books and like passing them on more. Um, but I love it. I love that it's a way to literally share a brain with someone for a period of time or exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so there, Galileo said, and this is in the 1400s, he said that, um, Reading was like a superpower and that we can transcend time and space through reading. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, cognitive behavioral therapists uh, have, have proven that reading has the same benefits as cognitive behaviors, cognitive behavior therapy. It's called bibliotherapy, the novel cure. And it is a studied and I know bibliotherapists and um, the idea is that when you immerse yourself in a novel that you experience empathy and you have this brand new uh, perspective in life by inhabiting mm -hmm. somebody's somebody's space somebody's mm -hmm. hand somebody's view it's 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 fascinating I, I yeah it's for people who aren't readers, I'm like, what do you do? Like, how do you, how, how do you function in life? Um, you know, when you we know, well, there are so many distractions yes. and that's why, um, you know, we have to, you know, make an effort and you know, make ourselves disciplined uh, because it is a gift to ourselves. And actually I'm always telling my son, like, you know, I'm a geezer. You're a kid. The compound interest of knowledge, you know, you've got another 60 years ahead of you. You, yeah. you can use this for another 60 years. So, you know, get smart, get smart early because mm -hmm. it you keep building on it. You totally can. Um, you know, I'd love to go back to eight-year-old you. Would, mm -hmm. 
Would she have imagined the life that you've created and would any, what would delight her and what would surprise her? Uh, I think the 60 year old me is absolutely delighted that I get to talk to the world through books. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was always a great reader at eight years old. And um, to the point where like, I would stay up all night reading and it was and and I'm still like that. Um, I think the eight year old me would be surprised that 52 years later that I have a 19 year old son. Yeah. Um, I think uh, the eight year old me would never under couldn't comprehend that someone could live in chronic pain for two decades and still maintain an an uncorruptible sense of optimism and gratitude. Um, I was a devout little kid. And um, so I am very aware of being um, grateful and giving back to the world. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, when I was a little kid, I would walk by uh, the street I live on. I live in the West Village. And I would say, someday I'm going to live on that street. And I am absolutely living on the same street with my best friend right upstairs. So what? The, the plans that I made at eighth, when, uh, when I was eight years old, um, a couple of them did come true. I, I think we overstep how wise we are, at, like in mm-hmm. that time period. Um, and I'm totally jealous that you're living the dream of living in a great neighborhood with your friend upstairs. Like, I'm pre- I think that was my wish when I was eight also. And I keep being like, how can we all live on the same neighborhood? Or do we need a compound somewhere? Um, yeah, we wanted to be like um, Mary Tyler Moore and Rhoda. Yeah. Or Lucy and Ethel. And we did. Um, and it's it's been amazing. We've lived, um, we were, we've were we been best friends since we were um, little kids. And we went to college together and roomed together after college. And she got married first and bought an apartment and then found our apartment. So um, I think again, like um, like our ideas, Epictetus says our soul is colored by our thoughts and that we are the sum of what we think about the most. And I think that I'm grateful and I am inspired um, to do good work and the thoughts that are running in the program of our mind. Mm-hmm. I just read that, you know, our, our brains, we are 40 trillion cells thrumming with life force and our brains, uh, which are the most evolved material in the universe. Marcus Aurelius said, there is a miracle in our head. We should essentially worship our brains. Um, and I think that when we, talk to ourselves that's almost the program that we're running Mm -hmm. and so if it's like oh i got a big keister oh i you know i've got ugly feet oh my jeans are too tight like if oh if you're filling your head with negativity i think that is what's going to be most prominent but if you can be like oh i got a small piece of cake i'm like whoa cake like i think like that absolutely has an impact directly into your attitude Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's making the choice, right? We can choose to be grumpy or we can choose to be psyched about what's happening. You know, I was recently in a bunch of national parks and like saying hi to everybody walking past that I am like sucking wind going up this ridiculous incline. And the person I was with like, why are you so happy? And I'm like, we're in a national park. <laughs> like, this is beautiful. We're not working we're on a road trip. Like, well, this is great. Why aren't we like jumping around? It's like, yeah, I'm sucking wind, but that's okay. That's, <laughs> yes, exactly. Like, I think we often get perfection uh, wrapped up almost like an invasive species onto happiness. And um, it's important, yes, to appreciate the moment and then keep stringing them together until you get a hat trick. 
Um, yeah, and we have to thank Theodore Roosevelt cr- for creating our National Park Service. I mean, yeah. I love that his nickname was a locomotive in human pants. <laughs> and Theodore Roosevelt was a great follower of the Stoics and wrote an amazing book called The Strenuous Life, um, where he believed in just being challenged. It's amazing. So I live just a few, blo- a few blocks away from where Theodore Roosevelt was born, and I really enjoy um visiting his birthplace. It's a national park. Um, and Theodore Roosevelt had um, terrible asthma where he couldn't even go to school. He had to be tutored at home. But his father would give him cigars to smoke to try and help him with the asthma. And he would have to juggle Indian clubs. And all of those are in his nursery. And he wound up actually building up his chest and became a boxer at Harvard and went on to live a long, strenuous life of great max. Well, so often I'll have clients ask me how to increase their confidence, especially around like selling or pitching their business. And I'm like, the only way you can gain confidence is by doing something scary. That's it. Mm -hmm. Or something that you don't think you can do. It doesn't have to be scary, but we get so nervous to be challenged as we get older. Um, Like before COVID had locked down everything, I had started practicing jujitsu Mm-hmm. And I was laughing so hard at myself every practice because I looked completely ridiculous. <laughs> like, I don't know what I'm doing. My hands and feet are in the wrong places. Mm-hmm. And as an adult, it's so unusual to be a complete idiot novice. And it was so refreshing. <laughs> that is so great because I think when you awaken, uh, your mind to trying something new Mm -hmm. again you put yourself in that sweet spot where more opportunities can happen and then you build up that confidence um and people always think like oh you know they're not going to do it until unless they do it perfectly but that Mm -hmm. is the joy is getting from like knucklehead to novice it it, it, that is a that is a great achievement um The word amateur is often thought of as a pejorative, but it means for the love of doing things like it's I I love that if you're an amateur, you're doing it because you love it, not Mm -hmm. that you're some second string nobody. You're doing it for purely the love. That's the only thing that's getting you on the mat for jujitsu. I love that definition. Yeah. And it's a great example also of how so many just words are taken out of context and redefined (laughs) in Western society today. Truly, I believe that sloppy speech leads to sloppy thinking. Mm -hmm. And uh, I I used to um, give up cursing for Lent. uh, And then I realized I should just stop doing it altogether. (laughs) There is a palliative benefit from weaving a tapestry of profanity, like when you whack your thumb with a hammer. uh, but I th- believe that when we speak clearly, it's because we value what we say. And uh, I mentor um, a couple of young women, and one of them wants to be an actress. And I said, "Okay, well, you've got to do, you've got to be great at something else besides just being an actress. Like, do something that you love and go get great at it, because that will then." give you the confidence. Um, I read a study about fear and the, the number one fear is not snakes or spiders or flying. The number one fear, nearly like 81% of Americans have it is fear of public speaking. And if you have that fear and you were at a funeral You would rather be in the casket than the one delivering the eulogy. So again, it's a great opportunity is especially for women who've been kind of socialized to uh, speak softly or not speak at all is to practice speaking and challenge yourself, call in radio shows. I mean, just little Mm -hmm. acts will get you there. You know, it's small actions and that's how you get to um, proficiency. Well, and it makes me go down an entire philo- philo- wow, excuse me, philosophical black hole of 
if the number one fear in the world today is public speaking, how many leaders are we missing out on? How many just people who can help be moving things forward and creating conversations when right now there seems to be such a void in true conversation, true discussion. And there's so many people that need to be spoken up on behalf of or for. Um, it, it just kind of breaks my heart thinking about how many people have so much to say and have so much compassion and are stuck behind the I can't speak up piece. Truly. And I mean, the oratory and the great um, orators, the, um, there's a great uh, CD that we have. It's like, you know, the best, um, like 50 greatest speeches in American history. And it's something like I like to listen to, just to listen to cadence. And again, like, like I'm not always this courageous. Sometimes I have to borrow somebody's courageous courage. And a lot mm-hmm. of times it's Epictetus or it's Seneca, or it's one of my favorite um, philosophers or, you know, Mother Teresa who said, we all can't do great things, but we can all do small things with great love. So I think, you know, many small steps um, taken action. I mean, it's, we're responsible for how we interact in the in the world and um you know if if we keep practicing and overcoming fear uh i think we will be in um, i think feel more confident in our own skin but also a greater um contributed contribution to society Mm -hmm. i i don't know where it comes from and i'm curious being a fellow East Coaster, if it's something in the water. Um, Mm -hmm. But there was always, I've never known a life where I wasn't encouraged to have, like give an opinion or have one, even if I wasn't meant to share it at that time. Like there was an expectation that you had an opinion and you contributed. And I don't really know where that comes from. And I can see it through family lineage if I look. And it seems to be a common thread from people I know who have an East Coast upbringing. I don't know if it's as reflective on the West Coast where I am now. But I think it's so interesting that those two things are are kind of twins, like side by side in have an opinion and then be a contribution. Where, where did that come from from you from family, from church, from like how ingrained was it in you and has it gotten deeply, more deeply rooted or has it, how's it changed as you have gone through life? I grew up in a big family with many raconteurs and uh, being able to crack the table up at dinner was looked as, as valuable as a great spelling test, like being able to tell a story. Mm-hmm. And um, and perhaps, you know, this comes from an Irish background where we are great storytellers. Um, but I think we have to infuse this with confidence. And I have a big, I, I, I believe in philosophy. I don't believe in self-help because I think there's too much emphasis on self and not yeah. enough a uh, not enough help mm-hmm. helping others um there was a study i read in this uh report called the oracle of the supermarket and said the reason why self help and diet books don't work is because the reward center of your brain lights up just for buying the book not for adapting any of the ideas Mm-hmm. And as we say, ideas don't count without without action. Um, so I find being of service to be a great. It, it, it really helps me with my confidence. Uh, mm-hmm. I um, am a hospice chaplain, and I thought like I I could just kind of like slowly lurk around the hospital <laughs> and secretly pray for people. They're like, no, 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 no. No. And I, I was like, no, nobody wants me bothering them. They're like, 
That's exactly what this is. You've got to knock on those doors. And I was like, but I spend a ton of time in the hospital. I don't want anyone else coming in. They're like, not everybody's like you. So it was a real, uh, probably some of the greatest lessons in my life um, as an adult came from taking a class on how to be a hospice chaplain. And um, another great lesson that I learned was, you know, I think, being afraid and then doing it anyway and it's don't expect perfection um but uh uh my teacher told us um he awakened us to this idea of finifugal which um is gaelic for fear of endings and that he would always say be aware of how you end things now i tend to get off the phone with like 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 as if my hair is on fire okay goodbye like I, 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 there's a reason why we call it the irish exit where you climb out the window without saying goodbye to anyone and um uh and kind of understanding okay it's good to think about how we end things and then uh seneca said every new beginning comes at some other beginnings end and so i like to cont- contemplate um how I can be better at ending things. I'm great at beginning them. I'll come in like a bull in a china shop, but then I slink out like like the Grinch walking down, going down the <laughs> stairs. What was it that made you want to be a hospice chaplain? I think because I don't scare easy. Now, um, I loved working at the nursing home. The nursing home where I worked um, closed down. Uh, and uh, when my son went to kindergarten, I thought, you know, this is an opportunity for where I can go back to school. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm so grateful I did. Um, and uh, after COVID and because of my illness, I can no longer practice in a clinical setting, but I use those skills every day as um, a patient advocate, a pain patient advocate for people who live in chronic pain and people who live with this disease that I have called sarcoidosis. So again, like we were saying, like the whole vibe is all skills are transferable. When yes. you gain proficiency in one area of your life, you can then pivot and apply that confidence and skill and knowledge and service to another area of your life. Part of my business coaching practice is helping people be in more alignment. Like how do you make money doing your thing? And what you just said is, is not really the secret, but the methodology of how can you put all the things that make you a unicorn and be of service and in a business setting, be paid to be of service. Doesn't mean that you're always paid to be of service, but that's kind of the magic sauce where you're like, wait, you're paying me to do this? Like I would have done it anyway. And you're like, yeah, like it's a valuable skill. And I think we don't, most people are not giving themselves credit for the fact that everything that's happened up to this point keeps making your little di- you know diagram, the center of it where they all overlap, get more and more defined. Um, cause I can only imagine how the disease that you are living with that, like how much access it gave you to things that you never thought you would have. Like, it, I didn't know it would be possible to live in this high of a register of pain. And now like, it's interesting. We were t- talking earlier about how I am aware of the way I speak. And early on when I was going through chemo and there's, we use many warlike metaphors in, mm-hmm. um, in, in, in healthcare. And the doctors were like, well, we're going to blast this. And then we're going to, you know, kill these and we're going to irradiate. And, and I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm a lover, not a fighter. Yeah. And they kept saying like, you know, you go imagine like visualize these cells fighting. And I'm like, I mean, I don't want to fight uh, my illness. I understand. Um, that does not mean I'm giving up, but I live in chronic pain every minute. And what I want to do is peacefully negotiate with my illness. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not capitulating, but I just, you know, if I hated, if I hated sarcoidosis and if I hated 
chronic pain. I would hate far too much of my life that would make yeah. it livable. Um, so I, I just accept it. And I think, you know, no one gets through life without, uh, you know, in perfect condition, we're all going to yeah. um, experience illness and other people that we love. And um, I believe that, yes, pain is inevitable, but suffering can be an option. So mm -hmm. while I live in chronic pain, I am not li living a life of suffering. And one of my favorite quotes is from Lord Byron, who said, always laugh when you can, because it's cheap medicine. <laughs> it so is. It, and, and I think and then laughing about what hurts the most. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. There's, I have uh, Sarah Saeed on the podcast recently, who's doing so much work for everything that's happening in Iran. And we were talking about the choices to punish the um, nation or the, the leadership, or we can empower the people. And like you, I'm so much more pro the love approach because it's more fun. It's more exciting. Like there's power, I think, in like the Care Bear stare versus mm -hmm. the opposite. Um, I'm definitely dating myself with Care Bear Stare references, mm -hmm. but it's, I, I, there's always an option to change our words to be powerful, to change our perspective to be powerful. I wish more people knew that the shift starts there. Uh, like, does it frustrate you seeing people who are choosing otherwise? Like, as much as you're b being in this in a positive, appreciative mindset, are you sometimes like, get over here, it's okay? <laughs> yes. Um, listen, I understand that um, uh, we are born with essentially a baseline happiness. And it's been proven that we can probably jimmy that up by 10% by you know, I, I believe by, you know, doing good works, by being appreciative. Um, Dan Harris, who's uh, one of my colleagues at the Zen Center, uh, believes in meditation, whatever it makes you happy. But I think if you want to change the world, you have to change your thoughts. And um, and it starts with you, rather like thinking, oh, I, you know, I can't, I can't do this. And somebody has to be the rock. And uh, I was just at a birthday party and um, and it was for a writer from Saturday Night Live and um, and he worked for Letterman. And it was really funny, like Triumph the Infult, Insult Dog gave a roast and Jimmy Fallon was singing uh, a parody song and the guy in front of me just keeled over. And that's a real way to clear a party. But I'm looking at him and I'm just like, all right. No, all right. Call nine one one. I'm going in to do first aid. And um, and uh, Tim Meadows was calling, and we were giving first aid on this guy. And then my friend said, "How did you know how to do that?" And I was like, "Well, I did take first aid, but I realized like like I have to be the one that will go. And then once I went to him, other people came. So I feel like one of the best things." is to take, I, I, truly, I made everyone at that party promise that they would take a Red Cross CPR course and uh, a first aid course. It's free. You can take it online. And, um, and I'm really on that because I feel like you have a confidence to know how to respond. And I also find that immersing myself in a such a radiantly positive, optimistic philosophy. Um, it, you know, these are is the program that's running through my head. So I feel like it's a gift to be able to share this with others. It is a gift. And I think, you know, so your story of jumping in to provide CPR, I think that it might be an example of how you have done life in general. Because when I look, if we just looked at your resume, there's so many different exciting things where I'm like, I, I'm amazed and so excited by people who have just said like, yes, that sounds fun. Yes, I want to be a mermaid. Yes, I want to be a VJ. Yes, I want to be a writer. Yes, I'm going to do CPR. And <laughs> there doesn't seem to be a limit to you 
saying like, not no, I, not that you don't have boundaries, but this curiosity to be like, oh, well, what's over there? Like how much is curiosity and like intrigue about these random things that end up in front of you? Like how much has that been fun for you to kind of play with the world and universe and how much of it have you seeked after it's up to us to be the architects of the type of life we want to live and i um and i was always adventurous Mm -hmm. and um when my world kind of slowed down because of my immune system i found ways to uh still communicate with the world and I, you know, I, I'm the associate producer of this movie that's just out right now called The Greatest Beer Run Ever. And uh, my son's babysitter was a film student at NYU. And he, his first movie won the Tribeca Film Festival. I was like, hey, let's think about doing some projects. And one night we were at a party and I introduced Andrew to a friend of mine, Joanna Malloy. And I said, Andrew, Joanna's a journalist. And he asked the best question. (laughs) He said, what's the greatest story that you never reported on? And she told us the story of how Chickie Donahue in 1968, uh, he was a veteran and four of his best friends from his neighborhood in Upper Manhattan were drafted to the Vietnam War. And there were all these protests and he didn't know how to feel and he wanted his friends to feel supported. And he decided, I'm going to get on a munition ship with a duffel bag full of Pabst Blue Ribbon and I'm going to go bring Pabst Blue Ribbon beer to my four best friends. So this is a story that has been told in bar rooms for 50 years. And once it landed in Andrew's ears, he's like, okay. So we made a short documentary And then I sent it to Pete Farrelly, who did Dumb and Dumber, and Mm -hmm. Pete had just done Green Book. And Pete um, took our YouTube 10-minute short documentary and made it into a theatrical. So I think um, one of my favorite books that I think everyone in the world should read uh, is by Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning. Mm -hmm. And Viktor Frankl says, say yes to life in spite of everything. Uh, That was the name of one of his um, lectures. And I think that is a really good motto. Yes to life, in in spite of everything, in spite of all the no and uh, the injustice, keep saying yes. Mm -hmm. It's up to us. So what I'm curious then, if, if, if it's up to us and if we should be saying yes to life, how does that translate to how you define powerful and ladies? And do those words mean something different when they're next to each other versus in, um, on their own? Well, I think that power comes from purpose. And uh, I heard President Biden speak. Uh, one of my friends um, lost her son, Dylan Hockley, in the Sandy Hook massacre almost 10 years ago. It's so sorry. And yes, it's, uh, but Nicole Hockley has turned her pain into purpose and created um, the Sandy Hook promise in um, sane gun laws and keeping our kid, kids safe. But um, President Biden was speaking and he spoke about purpose. And he said, in order to find our purpose, we need something to love something to do and something to look forward to. So I think purpose is absolutely the Siamese twin to powerful. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think to be a a part of the powerful ladies community, I think, you know, all of your, the guests that you have, they're sharing their stories of their Mm -hmm. purpose and the obstacles that they had to overcome. Marcus Aurelius says the obstacle is the way. What impedes us inspires us. So often, uh, you know, like I was just leading to your last, on your most recent um, podcast um, where um, 
the, the it was a manufacturing trays and all the obstacles oh, yeah. to get to the right uh, version. And it's blowing up. And the joy in her voice was, I don't know, I, th- I thought what's so great is that we can share in the celebration and listening to mm-hmm. Powerful Ladies podcast because it's such a gift to hear other other women succeed and whether they're in, in any area of life, politically, uh, whether it's through their own businesses, um, in media. And it's a great to kind of share that because, um, you know, they used to have the old boy network. Well, you know, yeah. you're the hot chick network, like you're the hot <laughs> smart chick network into the old boy network. <laughs> I, we're definitely renaming the entire group to yeah. the the Hot Chick Network. Absolutely, <laughs> I think I think people would prefer that name than Powerful Lady sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I th- I think it's so interesting the choices we make, right? And and when we get to that crossroad, and knowing like, oh, we are at a crossroad right now. Like there are moments in life when you can feel it, and I think back to moments that I have felt it and chose purposely to go left or right. And I also hear in your story of, especially dealing with your illness of like, no, I'm choosing to go right. I'm choosing joy and happiness. And I think often so many people get paralyzed in those moments because the, sometimes the fear and the literal pain and everything else is screaming, no, and the power and courage it takes to say yes. Like, sometimes I don't know where it comes from for, for people like yourself um, because, you know, it's like, wow. Like, did you, you, did you call on the entire universe to be like, I need all the yeses right now? Like, all the yeses in the universe? I need all of you right now. Yes. I mean, listen, the universe is made of us. The same yeah. four atoms in the universe are the same uh, atoms that make us up. And uh, again, what Viktor Frankl said, you know, he was a uh, he, he was a neurologist and a physician, and he said, "Yes, yes to life in spite of everything." Since we make about thirty five thousand decisions a day, a lot of them are involuntary. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of times, um, you know, I think the the words of Epictetus, beautiful choices make a beautiful life. And so making the choice to act in a way that is reflective of that maxim that swims in my head mm-hmm. every day, and, you know, to even small things, again, just carrying somebody's groceries, holding the elevator, you know, just mm-hmm. small acts of kindness build up. And then I think you really start to like, I, I like where I live. I like yeah. living in this noodle. Um, <laughs> I like that I'm game for adventure. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, so this, this has been a choice to be the architect of this life. Every Mm -hmm. decision that I made brought me here. And there's things that are out of my control and I understand that. Um, But what I can control, I will do the best to live and and to honor this life that I have and to give back and be a good role model. No, I wanna come back to you as an author because you, um, so many people choose, when they're brave enough to become an author, they never think that it would be a New York Times bestseller. They never think that Oprah will bless their book. Like, what was that feeling for you? And was it like, I knew it would happen or was it a holy shit it happened? Um, the first, my very first book, and I had been writing when I was at MTV, I had a column in glamour and uh i wrote for spin and and uh, a couple of other magazines so i had a collection of essays humorous essays and um my agent said no 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 it's i think you've really got to talk about how you're you kind of went from a woman who looked like she had everything to then losing like I lost 
I lost my job. I lost my health. I lost my fertility. I lost my hair. I grew a hunchback. You know, I, like I, I, I lost a lot of part of my vision and my feeling. And um, and and I was able to kind of share that and model patient. And as I've kind of grown as a writer, um, uh, I, I always feel that the books that I write are not they won't be judged as a success in my view by numeracy, whether or not they um, are bestsellers. Um, I feel like they are worthy of being bestsellers, but I kind of feel if I, if I can help 10 people, then it is, it has been worth the years of effort that I've put in, in a lifetime of reading. And um, I just, I just, I love it. I love, I love where um, reading and writing can take you. Um, it has been an, an extraordinary gift that they've been, the books that I've written have been recognized. And the fact that they've even been published um, are, is a, it, it's mind blowing, but I have purpose. I write every single day and I really work hard at it. And that is what I think shows up on the page. Well, you know, and I think what's so interesting as well is, is the, as you said, the amateur definition, right? The sake of writing for the love of writing and for sharing and connecting. And I, I've, you've heard me say it a million times in this podcast, like how much, how selfish this is for me. Like I get to hang out with you and like be tapped into your brain for this 45 minutes and be like, wow, okay, what else is in there? Like, what mm. else can we dig out in there? And, um, it's, it's surreal to, I think also be going through life and seeing it as it's happening. Cause there's these out of body moments that we have of, I've been working for this and you're like, Oh wait, it's happening right now. Like, wait, when you are, when you see your life happening outside of yourself, it's so cool and trippy at the same time. Um, but I think it also, it, to me, it's a, it's a signal that we knew this was going to happen. We've been working for this, and check, it's done. Now we got to go on to like what's next. Exactly, so, and also I think that's so important is like really like confidence in women is so attractive and it is not conceit like having confidence and walking in with a walking into a room be, knowing that you have a place at you know in the, in that room your voice matters um i think it's important to be elocution is very important and that uh this one year woman i'm ment mentoring i was like you have to work on your voice like you can't sound like a like a baby girl. You need to command. If if you really want to be an actor, like nobody wants to hear, you know, Blanche Dubois whisper. You're gonna have to <laughs> really find the tiger in you. And um, so I believe that having confidence, uh it is important for those of us who have earned our confidence to then light and kindle it in other women and mentoring is incredible. And that has been a great source of joy. Um, foster care to success. You can sign up for online mentoring. I love um, Camp Felix, the Felix organization, or even doing it informally, finding a way to be a mentor is uh, a great way to learn. Also um, as this, the great Stoics teach express that, um, when we teach, we are really learning and mm -hmm. it's a great symbiotic relationship. It's the best. Yeah. And then to layer on new friendships and relationships and the seeing the chain that you're creating, I think is also such a fun experience. Exactly. So I'd love to know what is next for you. So movies out, book is out. What is next that you were excited about or what are you working on? Um, I'm working on a new book, uh, uh, about stoic um, stoicism again. And, um, this idea of, we all know about memento more, remember to that you will die. And this is memento vivre, like remember <laughs> to live. I mean, I truly feel like I'm shot out of a cannon every day. And, 
I can't wait to step outside because I never know what's going to happen. I, I mean, I'm always looking for mischief and fun and just seeing what happens. Um, so I've got a, a new book that is in the in progress. Um, I have a documentary, which is um, about Bill Murray, which will be, it's called New Worlds, which is up for um, consideration for a Grammy. And uh, I've got another two films in production. Um, So, uh, but pretty much every day I am here writing because it is through daily practice and working on yourself daily that you wind up and where you want to get to get to. I love that. Well, we mm-hmm. ask everyone on the podcast where you put yourself on the powerful lady scale. If zero is your average everyday human and 10 is the most powerful lady you can imagine, where would you put yourself on that scale today and on a regular day? Okay. So today I'm all hopped up on caffeine and talking <laughs> to you. And uh, I had a go. Uh, I had to bribe the jackhammers who were on the guys who were jackhammering. I ordered them pizza and gave them beer. And I said, can you just be quiet for one hour? And they <laughs> so I kind of feel like that was a badass way to um, uh, get, get to this podcast. Bribery works. I learned that in parenting. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I would say, uh, yeah, today I'm, I'm full of beans. I would say I'm seven. I'm at my lucky seven. And um, I would say on days where I am roped to the sofa like Gulliver because of a pain flare, Mm -hmm. I still feel powerful. Even though I can't leave the house, I still look how lucky we are that we can speak to the world. You and I are on opposite sides of the continent Mm -hmm. and we're speaking through pictures and this box of wires on my table. Um, And, uh, you know, I think, you know, remember, remember a couple of years ago doing the power pose was all the rage. Uh-huh. Um, and I think uh, maybe there is a power pose in our brain and that's what I'm doing. My, my, it's, it, it is incredible that our brains are made out of the same material that's in the deli drawer of my refrigerator, fat, protein, and water. That's mm-hmm. all it is, but it's the miracle of life that adds breath and it's us up to us to honor this and worship our brains because that makes us powerful. It sure does. Well, it has been such a treat to get to spend today with you. Um, and the teenager of me who was fanning out on, Oh my gosh, there's someone with my name on MTV. <laughs> like, it's just, it's great to talk to you and for, to share your wisdom and to, Really just let the Powerful Ladies community hear another badass story of what's possible and what a great reminder to go and live and yes. live boldly. Like, go do it. What are we waiting for? Like Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yes, if anyone's interested in um, learning more about stoicism, I have a website called wiseupstoic.com. Awesome. And uh, we've got tons of information there, but I really, stoicism has kind of turned into broicism in a way Mm -hmm. and stoicism needs women and women need stoicism. So thank you so much for sharing this and for sharing, let's see, eight out of the 10 letters of our names. Right? Well, I was just thinking (laughs) like how many nicknames we must share between like Duff, Duffy, K-Duff, K-Duffy, like... Mm -hmm. We I, the fact that we haven't gotten each other's emails at this point is probably shocking. We, <laughs> it's so great. All the links to connect with Karen, her websites, her books, and all of her other projects are in our show notes at thepowerfulladies.com. Please subscribe to this podcast and leave us a rating and review. It is so critical in helping us connect with more listeners like you. Come join us on Instagram at Powerful Ladies. And if you want to connect with me directly, please visit caraduffy.com or on Instagram at Kara underscore Duffy. I'll be back next week with a brand new episode. Until then, I hope we're taking on being powerful in your life. Go be awesome and up to something you love.